Good morning to all of you. I'm Alberto Campagnolo from University of Padua. I will now present our work entitled Experimental Analysis of the Crack Propagation Threshold of Short Fatty Cracks in a Tool Steel Using SE and B Specimens. The co-authors are Giovanni Meneghetti, Luca Vecchiato, Filippo Sandoletti and Matteo Coba from SACMI. This work is motivated by several industrial case studies. Among them, the first one is the fatigue design of hydraulic presses manufactured by SACMI using up to 400 tons of ductile cast irons, which intrinsically have defects such as draws, porosities, chunky graphite and spiky graphite. These features act as defects or pre-cracks having size lower than 100 microns. Therefore, it is of paramount importance to know the threshold value of delta K below which crack propagation is avoided. Another example is the fatigue strength assessment of welded joints in presence of uh, small defects. According to the high uh, ESS approach developed by Zerbst and co-authors, the fatigue limit condition can be derived through a fractional mechanics approach, which requires the crack driving force, the material crack row resistance as a function of the crack length, and the initial defect size. The fatigue limit condition occurs when the crack driving force curve is a tangent to the crack row re resistance curve, that is the cyclic arc curve. In both case studies, it is uh, fundamental to experimentally derive the crack propagation threshold of uh, short fatigue cracks. When the long crack Paris curve is applied to short cracks, a pattern such as shown in the figure emerges. Different curves are obtained as a function of a load level, but in any case, crack propagation takes place well below the long crack threshold delta KTH. This can be explained since a crack closure phenomenon needs a certain crack size to fully develop. This is accounted for by the crack extension delta E dependency of the fatty crack propagation threshold delta K, which is the cyclic arc curve. Accordingly, the threshold delta KTH for short cracks can be written as the sum of the intrinsic component, which is a material property, and the extrinsic component, which accounts for the closure phenomena which built up during crack propagation and are due to plasticity, but also roughness and oxide or debris, up to the threshold of a long crack configuration for which closure mechanisms reaches a saturation. No standard procedures exist for the determination of a cyclic arc curve. The following steps are based on the recommendations provided by Meyer Offer, Pippan, and co authors. First of all, a fracture mechanics test specimen of the considered material must be defined. After that, to avoid the effects of the pre-cracking on the arc curve, small loads must be applied to initiate the crack, which in turn require very sharp notch. Ready in the order of 10 to 20 microns can be obtained by a razor blade technique. Then a pre-crack can be generated under cyclic compression, which uh, produces a region of uh, tensile residual stresses ahead of the crack tip, and therefore pre-crack is opened when unloaded. In the propagation test, the load is uh, stepwise increased, with the delta K being between the intrinsic and the long crack value. The crack will initially grow at each step, but uh, will then be harassed due to load shielding, due to the build-up of uh, closure mechanisms. Only when delta K reaches the long crack value, no arrest will uh, take place anymore. The cyclic arc curve is then generated by connecting the delta A delta K points of the consecutive arrest events. The material examined in this study is a 1.2311 mold steel for light alloys having hill stress of 1085 MPa and Vickers hardness between 318 and 330. The microstructure shows that tempered martensite is present along with a secular ferrite and dispersed carbides. Crack growth testing was carried out on a standard 4-point single-age notched band test specimens. The width was equal to 25 mm, the thickness B to 15 mm, and the notch depth equal to 4 mm. The notch was machined by EDM and the results in a notch tip radius of about 0.15 mm. Then, the razor blading has been applied to sharpen the original notch. To this aim, an electric motor drive and machine has been properly designed with a cam mechanism translating the rotary motion of electric motor into a translational motion of a slide equipped with a shaving blade which is pressed against the specimen notch tip with a force due to pre-compressed springs. The force value can be defined by properly setting the spring pre-compression. The video shows the razor blading machine working on a SEMV specimen. 
The figures report the original notch geometry and the adopted sharp blade. The razor blading technique has been applied to the SEMD specimen by setting a pre-compression load of 12 newton. A diamond paste with size of 3 microns has been added as a lubricant. The translational speed has been set to 6 razor blades per second, applied for 150 miles. The notch geometry after razor blading results quite different at site A and B. At site A, the depth was about 0.4 mm, while at site B, about 0.19 mm. The tip radius being reduced to 0.016 and 0.004 mm respectively. Finally, the blade is heavily worn. After the razor blading, the compression per cracking has been performed. To this aim, a shank servo hydraulic axial testing machine having load capacity of 100 kN has been adopted. A loading fixture has been used to transfer the axial compression load to four symmetric pins, generating a four-point bending loading condition to the specimen, which has been located and oriented so that the notch tip is in the region of a maximum bending moment and under a compression stress state. To avoid the notch effects on the stress intensity factor value at the crack tip, the ASTM standard requires a pre-crack long enough such that a 30 degrees envelope from its tip does not intersect the contours of the notch at any point. This requirement translates in a minimum pre-crack length of 0.40 mm. To determine the load which generates such a pre-crack, it is useful to recall the pre-cracking mechanism according to Meyerhofer and Coltus. In the first compressive loading, the monotonic plastic zone is formed. During unloading, plastic strain is partially reversed in the cyclic plastic zone, leaving most of the monotonic plastic zone under tensile stress. As the crack grows, the cyclic plastic zone shifts with the crack tip and its size decreases. A region of residual tensile stresses is found in the front of the crack tip in the unloaded case. With increasing crack length, the crack closure increases, inducing a reduction of the cyclic plastic zone size and of the crack grow rate until the crack tip approaches the boundary of the monotonic plastic zone when the crack wick will stop. Hence, the maximum size of a pre-crack produced by cyclic compression is determined by the plastic zone size. Therefore, starting from the expression of a plastic zone radius, the range of a stress intensity factor can be derived. After that, having in hand the shape factor of the equivalent crack, also the stress range and then the load range can be estimated. To obtain the minimum pre-crack length of 0.14 mm, a load range of 25 kN should be applied, which has been increased to 35 kN to theoretically obtain a pre-crack of 0.275 mm. The compression pre-cracking has been started by applying a load range of 35 kN at a load ratio of 20, however, after about 2 million cycles no pre-crack was initiated, therefore the load range has been increased to 44 kN, but again after 1.5 million cycles no pre-crack was visible. The load has been increased to 53 kN without any pre-crack after 1.5 million cycles. Finally, the load has been increased to 64 kN and pre-cracking has been effective after 1.3 million cycles. The resulting pre-crack is reported in the following figures, which show that different pre-crack lengths have been measured on the two sides of the specimen, that is 0.064 mm and 0.296 mm, the average being 0.18 mm, which respects the requirements of the ASTM standard. After that, the fatigue test to derive the hard curve has been started. Again, the same testing machine and loading fixture have been adopted. However, the specimen has been oriented so that the crack tip is under a tensile stress state with a load ratio of 0.05. The crack load has been monitored by both digital microscope and the direct current potential drop technique through the Matlect DCM2 device, which applies a 50 ampere current to the specimen hands and measures the corresponding potential drop close to the notch mouth, being correlated to the propagating crack length. During the propagation test, the load is stepwise increased. First, the crack load monitored by surface inspection using a digital microscope is presented. The test has been started with a load range of 4.19 kN, and after 2.85 million cycles, the crack has propagated at site A of 0.2 mm, while at site B no propagation was observed. After other 3.28 million cycles, the crack does not show future propagation, therefore the crack has stopped. 
then the load has been increased of 10%, reaching 4.61 kN, which makes the crack propagates of about 0.06 mm at site A and 0.16 mm at site B, after 1.13 million cycles. After other 2 million cycles, the crack does not show future propagation at site A, while it propagates of 0.055 mm at site B. Finally, after other 1 million cycles, the crack has stopped. Accordingly, the load has been increased again of 10%, reaching 5.06 kN, and after 9 million cycles, the crack has propagated at site B of 0.038 mm, while at site A it does not show future propagation. A reduced average crack row rate demonstrates that the crack has stopped. The load has been increased again of 10%, reaching 5.58 kN. The crack started to propagate as detected after 3 million cycles, and it does not stop anymore even after other 3 million cycles. Therefore, the long crack propagation threshold has been exceeded and the crack was propagating as a long crack according to the Paris regime, up to the final failure of the specimen. The fracture surfaces show the original notch depth, the resulting per crack and the region of crack propagation and stops. The following figure shows the data acquired during the whole hard curve test as a function of the loading cycles, which reaches 30 million cycles. The black curve represents the load range, while the green and the blue ones represent the crack length measured by the microscope at site A and B. Finally, the red curve represents the average crack length. The figure shows that the crack starts to propagate and then stops due to the built-up of closure mechanism for three times. Having in hand the crack lengths and the corresponding applied loads, it is possible to calculate also the range of the uh, stress intensity factor and to define a threshold uh, when a crack stop has been detected. These results will allow to define the hard curve. In addition, the crack row has also been monitored by the direct current potential drop technique, which allows to measure the potential drop close to the notch mouth as a function of the loading cycles. Then, a calibration curve which correlates the potential drop to the length of the propagating crack can be adopted to translate the acquired data in terms of crack length as a function of loading cycles. The Johnson formula is uh, widely adopted in the literature, however, it is well known that uh, it is affected by variations of the material electrical resistivity due to the temperature variation. To overcome this issue, a dual-channel DCPD system based on a free probes configuration has been adopted. The potential drop active channel delta VPD is measured across the crack, while a reference channel delta VT is measured uh, between one probe of the active potential channel and a fear probe located on the same specimen. The ratio delta VPD over delta VT does not depend on the resistivity and therefore on the temperature. To derive the calibration curve we adopted the CPD configuration, three-dimensional electrical thin thermal analysis have been carried out by adopting 10-node tetrahedral and 20-node brick solid elements with the element size of 0.5 mm in the cracked region. One quarter of the geometry has been considered, a zero-volt electrical potential has been applied to the uncracked portion of a net section area and the current to the specimen hand. Several finitement analyses have been performed by modeling a crack of depth A to from the notch tip and by evaluating the potential drops delta V P D and delta V T. The figure reports the results in terms of a crack length A as a function of the ratio delta V P D over delta V T and the fitted calibration curve. The following figure shows the data acquired during the bull hard curve test as a function of loading cycles. The black curve represents the load range, while the blue one is the potential drop delta VPD, which shows strong variations without any correlation to a continuous crack growth and a subsequent slowdown and stop, this being due to the temperature variations. The next figure reports the uh, reference potential drop delta VT, which again strongly depends on temperature. Finally, the ratio delta VPD over delta VT, which is independent of uh, temperature, shows that a correlation with uh, the propagating crack length can be guessed, since the signal increases and then stabilizes at a constant value each time the load is increased. Therefore, by adopting the previous fitted calibration curve, results can be translated in uh, terms of uh, crack length as a function of the loaded cycles. The figure shows that uh, the crack starts to propagate and then stop for three times. Having in hand the crack lengths and the corresponding applied loads when a crack stop has been detected, it is possible to derive the crack extension delta here referred to the reference closure-free crack length. 
and the threshold value in terms of a stress intensity factor range according to their reported expressions. The tables summarize the obtained results when referring to microscope or DCPD crack length measurements. The results can be fitted by using a power law with the two parameters A and B. The results are also summarized in the figure, where the R curve has been fitted on DCPD based results, showing the typical trend reported in the literature for other materials. The results based on microscope measurements show a deviation as compared to DCPD data, even while considering the average values. This could be due to the sensitivity of the adopted digital microscope and to the fact that the microscope can only monitor surface crack propagation. Finally, to conclude, the Fadi crack propagation threshold of short cracks in a tool steel has been experimentally analyzed using SEMB specimens. The cyclic hard curve has been derived by the following steps razor blading, compression for cracking, crack roll test with a stepwise rising load amplitude. The razor blading has been applied by an electric motor driven machine equipped with a shaping blade, reducing the notch tip radius from 0.15 to 0.01 mm. The pre-cracking has been performed under cyclic compression to induce a region of tensiles with stresses ahead of crack tip, avoiding closure effects. The crack load test has been performed with a stepwise rising load amplitude under 4-point banding loading and with a load ratio of 0.05. Both the optical microscope and the CPD techniques have been applied to monitor the crack length during the fatigue test. The results have shown that the crack roll monitoring based on the DCPD is advantageous due to higher sensitivity and the possibility of monitoring the propagation inside the material and not only on the surface. The obtained results are only preliminary, our curves will be derived with other specimens, again for R equal to 0.05 for comparison purposes and also for different load ratios to investigate the mean stress effect. With this I have concluded, thank you for your attention.